Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brooks Show starts now. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, actually, to the last episode, the last, the very last episode of the Yaron Brooks Show on the blaze, which kind of makes me sad. I mean, I'll miss you guys, and uh, but of course... You can keep listening to me. I'm not going away completely, just going away from the blaze. Uh, you can follow all of my uh, different podcasts and different shows and different lectures and debates and uh, media interviews on YaronBrookShow.com. YaronBrookShow.com. You can also, of course, find uh, much of... Uh, you can follow me on, on Facebook, Yaron Brook on Facebook or on Twitter, and you can, let me see, what have I forgotten? You can subscribe on YouTube as well. So uh, you can subscribe, you can follow, you can like. You can go to the website. You can even support me financially and, and help, uh, help me uh, uh, with my uh, independent show as we move forward by making a contribution on Patreon.com. So... Uh, a little bit of a sad day, but that's okay. We, you, you know, we go on and we, we, we continue on the battle, on the battle. I, I wanna, I wanna return today, given that this is my last show. It's a few themes that we have talked about uh, on, on this show over the last uh, six months. Uh, themes that I, I keep repeating, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna focus on a few topics that where we can illustrate these themes. But I really wanna leave you with with these you know basic thoughts and and really it boils down to what we talked about last week what we talked about over and over and over again and that is kind of what america what america is what it makes america special but more broadly what is it that's required for human success for human flourishing and there have really been two positives and two negatives that I've emphasized and I've tried to emphasize to some extent in every single show that I've done. The positives are that to be successful as an individual, one must be dedicated to reason. Reason is our means of knowledge. Reason is the way in which we learn about the world. Reason is the way in which we know what is true and what is false, what is, false, what is right and what is wrong. Facts, reality is our test, not emotion, not revelation, not what's written in books, not what the President of the United States says, not what an economist said, not what a radio talk show host says, not what anybody says. Reality, facts, logic, that is the standard for truth. And a dedication to the truth, a dedication to facts, a dedication to reason is what makes an individual great. So let's make each one of us great again by rededicating ourselves to the truth, to facts, to logic, to reason. But to do that, we need to dedicate ourselves, in a sense, to ourselves. The other thing that makes this country great or makes any country great that practices this or is necessary for individual success is to view the primacy of the individual, to to take your life seriously, to strive to make your life the best life that it can be. Now, how does this apply politically? Politically, the unit of importance, the only unit of significance is the individual. And the political theory that advocates for this, the political theory that animated the founding fathers was individualism. The idea of the sanctity, the primacy of the individual. And that's the way to think about everything in politics. Every issue that comes up, one must think, what impact does this have on the individual in principle? And the way to think about that is through the idea of rights. The government's job is only to protect the individual's rights, to protect him from force, fraud, to protect him from other people trying to steal his stuff, take his stuff. And of course, the government is the biggest thief of all, has been throughout history. 
So the whole idea of individual rights is to protect us from our own government. So on any issue in politics, and we'll cover a few controversial ones today, the idea must be, the thought must be, how does this relate to individual rights? How does this relate to the government's job in protecting a right to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness? How does this relate to the government's job to protect my freedom, my ability to act in pursuit of my own rational values? Is it hurting that? Then it's wrong. Is it helping it? Then it's good. So since, you know, most talk radio and most podcasts and most of what's being talked about out there, I guess not most podcasts, but most of what talk radio is about politics, let's focus in on politics. So when one looks at what a politician might be recommending, might be suggesting, the standard must be how does this impact the issue of rights? How are the lives of individuals? How is individual freedom affected by what is being proposed? Is this good for individual freedom? Or is this bad for individual freedom? That, ultimately, is the question. And if it's bad for individual freedom, it must be rejected. If it's good for individual freedom, then it should be embraced. So let's take a topic that I think some of you might be already bored with. I know I talk about this a lot, but I really want to go deep and I really want to cover it. Given, given uh, my last opportunity here on The Blaze, I really want to cover it. It's in the news in, in greater depth than maybe I have in the past. And, I, and I'd love to take your phone calls if you have an opinion about this. And that is the issue of free trade. Because I think this is so important and so crucial because it represents these two issues that I've been talking about. Reason versus emotion. What does reason tell us about trade? How do we emotionally respond to trade? Individualism versus collectivism versus tribalism. How does this affect the individual? How do we think about trade from an individualist perspective? How do we think about trade from a collectivist, tribalist perspective. America should be the land of reason and individualism and should reject anything that is based on emotion and tribalism. And yet we have a president who is constantly, constantly hopping on emotion and on tribalism. So let's look at, uh, you know, so, so Donald Trump right now is, uh, is in Davos. Davos is a, uh, a town in Switzerland. I think it's up in the mountains. I think it's a ski resort. Where once a year, the elites, the elites that he constantly, constantly uh, opposed and, uh, and spoke up against throughout the campaign, meet every year to, to chat and discuss and have presentations and talks. Yesterday, uh, or the day before yesterday, George Soros spoke, uh, you know, the, the Chancellor of Germany spoke, uh, Bill Gates is there, everybody, all, all the who's who of the world, political, business, and even intellectual elites are there. And, and of course, Donald Trump couldn't stay away. And Trump, uh, Trump gave a talk yesterday, and... Uh, and it was basically this mishmash of um, stuff that really is, means nothing. I'll, I'll give you a great example of this, and this relates to trade. Of course, he's going there representing this idea of America's open for business. But of course, just the day after he's placed barriers to entry and tariffs on uh, washing machines and uh, solar panels. We'll talk about that. This is a day... After he's increased trade barriers, he's going there to say, we're open for business. We want lots of trade. And of course, he's going into a place that is very pro-trade. The global elites are very pro-trade. So, uh, you know, he's got a bit of a hostile audience in front of him. So this is, uh, this is a sentence from, from, from Trump, just to illustrate kind of the what I consider the insanity of this president. He says, he says, that, 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 I'm paraphrasing now, quote, U.S. supports free trade, he said, quote, but it needs to be fair 
and it needs to be reciprocal. It needs to be fair and it needs to be reciprocal. Now, I don't know how trade can be unreciprocal. By definition, trade is reciprocal. Now, he might be saying that the trade, that the free trade needs to be reciprocal. That is, the other party has to engage in free trade, which means they have to have no barriers. Well, if that's his intention, he, he, you know, he doesn't seem to be going about it the right way. Uh, by raising tariffs here, you're only encouraging the unreciprocality from the other side of them raising tariffs. And the fact is, and we'll talk about this in, in more details in a minute, that it doesn't matter whether the other side is reciprocal or not. Free trade is good for us. Whether they're reciprocal or not, it's better for us if they're reciprocal. It's better for everybody. But it's still good for us, even if they're not. And what does fair trade mean? I mean, fair trade, this one, this one boggles the mind, if you will. It's, it's a term, and I've said this before on the show, it's a term invented by the left. Invented by the left to suggest that trade is somehow unfair. Um, if, let's say, um, the other party is paying their employees lower wages than you are, or if, um, I don't know, uh, the, the environmental regulations in the other country are different than the environmental regulations in your country, then it's unfair. This is a, a purely, a purely uh, leftist, leftist term that was invented by the radical, the, 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 the worst kind of progressive leftists 20 years ago uh, to go after trade and now embraced completely by this Republican administration and by Donald Trump, uh, who, you know, when it comes to economic, many economic issues is ultimately just a leftist. So uh, what I want to show today is that fair trade the only kind of fair trade is free trade. There is no other fair trade. And that free trade is, should be unilateral. And, uh, uh, you know, it would be nice if it was reciprocal. And, of course, that all trade is reciprocal. You give up something and you get something. That's the nature of trade. And it's fair, fundamentally, at the core, because both parties are engaged with it. Now, one of the accusations I get a lot when I talk about this topic is, oh, you're on, you're just an idealist. Yeah, in a perfect world, free trade would be great, but we don't live in a perfect world, so it doesn't work in a non-perfect world. So one of the things I want to refute is that claim. No, free trade is good right now in the unperfect world in which we live. It's always the preferred, the better solution. It's practical and moral. It's the only answer based on reason and based on the individual's well-being on the rights of the individual. All right, so we're going we're gonna to delve into that. We're going to start with what an individualist approach to trade has to be. How do you look at trade as an individualist versus as a tribalist? Um, and we'll do that right after this break. Uh, in the meantime, you can call in 888-900-3393 with all your challenges, all your questions, all the examples you have to show me I'm wrong, to show me what an idealist detached from reality I am. Go ahead. Looking forward to it. 888-900-3393. And we'll be right back after these messages. Is Hey everybody, we're back. Uh, by the way, uh, those of you who uh, might be in the South Carolina area for whatever reason, <laughs> I will be giving a, a talk uh, at uh, Clemson University in South Carolina on Tuesday, on this coming Tuesday. It's going to be a lot of fun. The title of the talk is Capitalism versus Socialism, which is the moral system. I think you can all imagine what position I'm going to be taking in that debate. But it's open to the public. You can come. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's worth the drive. So if you live in Columbia or you're in, uh, certainly in Greenville, uh, come over to Clemson University, 530. So you'll have to take off from work a little early. 
but I promise it's going to be worth it. Hopefully, I'm hoping, hoping um, that a bunch of socialist students show up and, and challenge me on this. I love, I love debating socialists, particularly if they're young and innocent and naive. I soon uh, uh, get them to not be that anymore, and then they have to real choice on their hands because they are then confronted with the truth. So capitalism versus socialism, which is the moral system? At Clemson University, 5 p.m. on Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, yes, in three days, I'll be in Clemson, uh, flying from Puerto Rico direct into Charlotte and then driving down to the wonderful, beautiful, amazing University of Clemson. Unfortunately, I can't say this year, national champions, they didn't quite make it. All right. Um, so what would an individualist approach to trade be? How do you think about trade? Well, the first thing to recognize, the first thing to recognize and the first thing, point to make in every discussion about trade is the very nature of trade one-on-one -on -one, between two individuals, always bring it back to the individual. Why do you trade with other people? And, and the purpose of this is to dismiss the notion that, that Marxists are trying to perpetuate in the world around us. The trade is a zero-sum game. That if you benefit from trade, the other party has to lose from trade. So the point is, the trade is, or at least in its intention, you go into trade trying to make your life better off, and so does the other party. Trade is a win-win transaction, at least in intention. Sometimes you buy a lemon, sometimes you're fooled, sometimes you make a mistake. But the intention is always win-win. Trade is not zero-sum. When I buy an iPhone for $300, I've used this example a million times, I know, my life is better off by more than $300. That's why I get into the trade. And Apple is better off. Apple's numbers are better off. Because, because they valued the $300 more than the phone. They made a profit. I won and Apple won. Nobody lost. There was no losing. Trade is win-win. It's voluntary, and that's, it's reciprocal, to use Donald Trump's words. And it's fair, because as long as there's no fraud being committed, I get what I expected, I pay what I promised, everybody's a winner, everybody's better off. So that is the most important concept to get, trade as a good, value-added, positive thing for the individual, for all the individuals who participate in it. And that at the end of the day, the reason to engage in it is to better your life. Either by gaining money, by selling something so that you can then use your money to buy something else that's more valuable to you. Remember, at the end of the day, money is there in order to buy stuff, in order to consume, in order to enjoy life, in order to have fun. And yeah, you can save some. It's important to save some. So that in the future you can consume. There's no point in money left over when you're dead. Well, unless you want to help your kids or grandkids. But the purpose of making money is to consume. So the individualist approach is first to identify the benefit from trade. And then to recognize that only individuals trade. Countries don't trade. Collectives don't trade. Tribes don't trade. Individuals trade. I go to Walmart and I buy stuff. I don't know, you know, let's say, not in Walmart, wherever it is. I bought this uh, preamp to improve the quality of sound for my podcasts. I don't actually know where this preamp was made. And I have to admit, I don't care. Somebody somewhere in the world made this preamp. I benefit because I got the preamp, which is more valuable to me than the money I gave up. This person 
and all the people who are intermediaries from the store that sold it to me that happens to be in the US to the supplier who supplied it from China, let's say who happens to be China to the individual who actually put this together to the guy who had the idea of how to put it together to his boss to everybody in between all made something off of the transaction. We're all better off. I'm better off. The Chinese guys are better off. Why do I care that I just made a Chinese person better off rather than a Russian person or rather than a, an American person? My goal in trade is not to improve your life. It's to improve my own. When I go into a store and buy something, I don't think to myself, oh, great, this is an opportunity to help the owner of the store make a profit. I don't go into the store thinking, oh, cool, this is an opportunity to make some textile company in South Carolina better off. I don't care. I really don't care. I go into the store to make my life better off. That's it. Period. End of story. And what if you told me, look, by going into that store, you're not going into the other store. You're hurting the other store. That's bizarre. That's ridiculous. I'm trading, you know, to improve my life. That's the purpose of what I do. I'm not in the business of trying to improve your life. That's your job. That's your responsibility. I'm not in the business of caring which store goes bankrupt and which survives. That's not my business. I want to buy the best product for the best price for me. I'm not interested in what's going to stimulate the US economy or not stimulate the US economy. I'm interested in making my life better. And indeed, any one of my decisions is a positive stimulus to the US economy. We'll get to that. So trade is done between individuals for the purpose of bettering themselves, not for some altruistic, collectivistic, tribal, nationalistic, macroeconomic reason. Trade is for me, making my life better. Mm -hmm. I buy nice clothes, I buy nice shoes, I buy my iPhone, I buy my preamp to improve my lot in life. I don't, I don't think when I go and buy stuff, was this made by a robot? Oh my God, I can't buy it, it's destroying jobs. No, I'm buying the best product at the cheapest price. That's what it means to be an American, to improve your own life, to value your own life so much that you go in, you go and buy stuff that is going to make your life better. All right. Now, I know there are tons of objections, but we'll get to that. Um, we're coming up on a break. So, uh, at the, you know, if you're calling about miscellaneous topics, I will get to you, but much later in the show. Right now... I will prioritize Ten. callers on trade. You're listening to your Unbook Show. We'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to the Yaron Book Show. All right, so of course on the chat, I've already been accused of uh, twisting the president's words to undermine the message and act like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, let me be very clear about Donald Trump and trade. Donald Trump doesn't know what he is talking about. He is the most ignorant president when it comes to economics that, I, that the United States has ever had, as far as I can tell. Now, maybe they've been more ignorant ones, but he doesn't know anything about economics. And he, certainly about trade, he doesn't know anything. And, and he contradicts himself all the time. But he certainly, in his Davos speech and everything that I've heard him say, he is wrong on trade. He is wrong on trade. And as to the example that the person then follows up with, I will get to that, I promise. But, but the fact is that you don't know anything about trade. You're wrong about the economics of trade. All right. Now, again, if, if you want to call in about trade, go ahead and do it. If you want to correct me about Donald Trump, go ahead and do it. But I, I've got two callers. I've got Joseph and Skyler, and they want to talk about something, I think, completely different, and I'm going to wait on you. Uh, it might be to the last segment of the show because, um, because that's when I open it up to general questions. But I want to, I've got a lot to say on trade. And I want to finish it. I want to cover everybody's objections. So this is a place you send your friends to when you want uh, them to defend trade. By the way, if you want to read about trade, I think the best writer online about trade is Donald Boudreaux. 
Donald Boudreau, an economist out of George Mason University who's excellent on this issue. He actually, I think, writes regular letters to the editor responding to Donald Trump's uh, stupidities about this issue on a regular basis. He's, he's excellent. Um, all right, so trade, win-win. I go into it in order to enhance my life. Uh, I don't really care about uh, who's losing their jobs bec in one store because I'm in the other store. That's not my business. It's not anybody's business. It's not the job of government either. What about trade deficits? Well, again, think about it this from an individualist perspective. Each one of us runs a massive trade deficit with the grocery store. Every day, you go to the grocery store, and you leave cash there, and you get stuff. And that's what a trade deficit is. The United States, quote, supposedly has a trade deficit with China. We buy their stuff, just like you buy stuff from the grocery store, and we leave dollar bills in China. So what? Trade deficits make zero economic difference. Now, they're reflective of all kinds of economic phenomena. They're reflective of the fact that the Chinese want to buy American stuff and invest in America. So they sell to us so that they can get dollars, so they can use those dollars to buy our stuff and to invest in our country. Just like the grocery store is getting our dollars, not so we can accumulate dollars and stuff them in the mattress, so that the owners of the grocery store can pay their employees, who can then go and consume, who can, who the owners of the stores can make a profit so that they can go and consume, you know, I don't know, their, 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 their yachts or their, their fancy cars or whatever it is. But there is no, zero, economic argument anywhere in the economic literature that argues that trade deficits are a bad thing. It just, it just doesn't exist. Certainly not if you believe even a little bit in free markets. And again, from an individualist perspective, you're the only one trading. There is no country. The country of America does not trade with the country of China. You as an individual trade with some Chinese guy. You have a trade deficit with this Chinese guy. So what? I have a trade deficit in my mall. I have a trade deficit with everybody except my employer, where I give him my hours and I get for that money. So trade deficits are irrelevant. They don't make any difference. They don't make any difference. Again, no economist worth anything has ever claimed that trade deficits are a bad thing. And, and Paul Krugman, who now claims that, used to be very pro-free trade. That's, how he got, that's what he got his Nobel Prize in economics for. And indeed, one of the things Don Boudreau does on a regular basis is point out how wrong uh, how Krugman today contradicts Krugman of the past. But that's because Krugman is a political hack. He is no longer an economist. I like to call Paul, Paul Krugman uh, the former economist, Paul Krugman. Now, imagine that you go into a store and you find their products particularly cheap. And you kind of ask around, what, what's going on? I mean, they're really good and you buy stuff. And then you ask around and it turns out that the reason the products are cheap is because the owners of the store are running a, uh, are losing money. And that they have a rich uncle who basically subsidizing, basically gives them money so that they can continue to run the store. In other words, providing them with subsidies. And now the other stores in the mall don't get that subsidy. Only the one store with the rich uncle gets the subsidy. And therefore they're underpricing their goods. That's why they can afford to lose money. And other stores are losing business as a consequence. Would you stop going to that store? They're offering you cheap goods, good goods. Why is it any of your business? I wouldn't stop. I don't think any of you would stop. I, I know none of you inquire. None of you try to figure this out. Right? Who cares if they're getting subsidized by their uncle? So the whole idea, the whole idea that, uh, you know, if you're subsidizing their industry, if you're subsidizing, then you, you shouldn't buy from them. Why? It just means it's cheaper for you. Who's going to lose from the subsidy? Well, the uncle is losing a lot of money. And ultimately, the store will go bankrupt. Ultimately, the store can't run itself. 
And the uncle is never going to return the capital he invested. It's a bad business practices. They go out of business. That's their problem. Again, not mine. All right, before we go on, there's a lot more to say. Before we go on, let me uh, take a couple of questions. All right, uh, Naveen in Minneapolis. Uh, you're on the Iran Book Show. Hi. Hey, Iran. Uh, good question about, uh, about monopolies. The, uh, the common objection that comes about is around monopolies, big guys and little guys. And so this is around um, copyright infringement and those kinds of things. Um, so how, what is the government's role in setting up a good judicial structure so that the little guys are not, um, they don't copy the products of, let's say, Apple yeah. and um, yeah, so, so you're being like a, unfairly, and, yeah. and, and, a, and a big company doesn't shut them down even when they're not copying. You know, yeah, like so that. first, I don't buy the whole monopolies argument. Again, the, in a free market, there's no such thing as monopolies. In a free market, um, in, a, in a free market, there's always competition, and you can be big, 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 but you're going to be competed against. So I don't worry about, uh, about monopolies. I don't think they're a phenomenon. If, if there's a monopolist in China... That's China's problem. Or if, if um, uh, so, I don't. You know, if, as long as their prices are low, as long as the quality is good, then they will maintain their market share. If their prices go up, as monopolist prices usually do, and if the quality deteriorates, then competition will arise. It always happens, and it always will happen. That's the nature of markets. The nature of markets is for companies to strive to become, to strive to become. Uh, a monopolist. All companies strive to become a monopolist. That's how you make profit. And competitors to, to take away monopoly profits from the monopolist. That's the nature of markets, and that's a healthy process. So I'm not worried about the monopolist. Now, the second issue is a worry, and it's the one constraint I would place on trade because it's the job of government to protect rights. So if a company is violating rights by stealing, stealing intellectual property, for example, as many companies in China do, then it's appropriate for the government to step in and say, we don't, you cannot bring your, your goods into this country because they're stolen goods. So, for example, if the government knew that there was, a, there was a Chinese company that was stealing stuff at the harbor and shipping it back to the United States under a different name, they would stop it because that's just stealing, and we know that. Well, the same is true if a company, know, if, if, if the government knows that a Chinese company is stealing the intellectual property of an American company like Apple, and it's trying to sell its goods in the United States, then it should be stopped. But that's not about tariffs. It's not about, uh, 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 you know, uh, imposing a, a ban on Chinese goods. It's about identifying the products and the companies that are guilty of copyright infringement and banning them and banning people from trading with them. That, that's much simpler and much easier. And it clearly identifies the real issue, which is the crooks. We shouldn't be trading with crooks. If, 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 the same would happen if the store in the mall. If the store in the mall was, was selling dresses labeled uh, Chanel, but it was actually not Chanel, they were just copying Chanel designs, then the government would step in and, and arrest those people, as they should. That makes sense? So are you saying that the government should voluntarily um, look for these kinds of things? or? Um, yeah, no, it's part, it's part of their law enforcement. It's part of their law enforcement's responsibility is, is to look into these things and to discover the crooks. And now, you know, without being overly intrusive, but these things are pretty obvious when they happen. And then uh, ban those particular goods. And, and the Chinese would get the message if we did that. But, of course, we don't do that because... Not because we're not tough on trade, but because we're not tough on property rights. And, and the government doesn't know what to do. The government is not today dedicated to protecting the individual rights, particularly property rights of Americans. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Thanks, Naveen. Yeah, thanks. Bye. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go to Frank, who's calling from New York, who wants to ask if tariffs are good or bad. You're listening to your Run Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. You're clear. The Yaron Brook Show. 
All right, so let me, let me just say a couple of things. We're talking about trade today. Um, and for those of you who don't know, my last, my last day on the blaze. And, and by the way, if you take one thing from my show, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, it, it, one takeaway from my show is go read Ayn Rand. If you haven't read Ayn Rand yet, go read Ayn Rand. And we'll get to, we'll get to you, Tara, in a little bit. And Frank, just give me a couple of minutes here. I want to say something about the monopolies uh, from earlier. If you worry about monopolies, free trade is wonderful because what you're creating is global competition. It's not just the companies in your own country that are competing with one another. Now, it's open up to the world. So, for example, Boeing has a monopoly over airplane production in the United States. But when you open up globally, suddenly you have competition from Airbus and maybe from a Chinese uh, uh, plane manufacturer in the future. And now you have competition and less risk of the bad consequences of so-called monopolies. Um, the second thing I wanted to say, well, oh yeah, let me, let me just say this. So the example I gave where you go into the store and, and the, the prices are cheap because the uncle is subsidizing it. Imagine if you found out that this uncle was actually a senior person in the mafia and that he was using basically the proceeds from the mafia to fund this store. Now, at that point, you could have real objections. And you could say, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to shop at this store, right? I, I don't want to support people who are involved in the mafia. And that would be legitimate for you as an individual to do. It would be illegitimate for the police to say we're shutting down the store because we think your uncle is part of the mafia. It has nothing to do with the owners of the store. He's just giving them money. As long as it's declared, hasn't broken the law, that's not the issue. But you can make them all stand and say, I'm not going to shop here because you guys, everything, everything here is tainted. I don't want to buy it. So take, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chinese companies that are state-owned. If you as an individual don't want to buy stuff from a state-owned company because you know that state-owned companies are basically using taxpayer money, theft, in order to produce stuff, then don't buy their stuff. But it's not the U.S. government's job to prevent you from buying. That's a choice you get to make. I'll give you an example. I refuse to buy an American car. I refuse to buy an American car, particularly General Motors. Why? Because they were bailed out. They were bailed out. My tax money was used in order to bail them out. I'm offended by that, even more so. I refuse to buy a Tesla. I will not buy, I don't care how good Tesla is. I don't care how wonderful the screen is, the technology is, how pretty the car is, how fast it is. I will not buy a Tesla because I'm offended by the fact that it is heavily subsidized by the U.S. government. Now, note that if you really took that seriously, and I don't, Luckily, take that seriously because my life would be over if I did. Your life would be over because everything is subsidized. Everything's regulated. Everything's controlled. Everything is given favor to, whether it's in China or in Germany or in the United States. Unfortunately, the sad truth is we don't live in a free market inside the U.S., never mind free trade. So my policy is unless I know explicitly from some source that this product was created through immoral illegitimate activities supported, for example, by the government, I have no problem. And, and when it comes to foreign goods, I have no problem buying stuff from anybody. Now, again, I won't buy stuff from North Korea. I will not go visit Cuba. I will not support communist. China is not communist. Not anymore. Not anymore. It's not the job of the government, though, to tell me, unless the country is an enemy state. If the country is an enemy state, then you, the government can restrict trade. Other than the cases of enemy states, the government has no job in trade, no responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis trade. Zero tariffs is the only policy, and that brings me to Frank in New York. Hey, Frank, how's it going? Hi, how are you doing? Yes, this is Frank uh, who posted the other day on Facebook about the tariffs with reacting to what President Trump was doing with the washing machines and the solar panels. So um, I've done this before. I mean, whenever he talks about this, I, 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 I want to say, like, Mr. Trump, you're showing us that you're not really for capitalism. What are you doing? 
tariffs are not really free trade. And I also posted something about the Smoot-Hawley Act yep. of the 1930s. Okay. Right. Maybe you could tell the people about that. And, and you, di you did make a comment on my post the other day, too, and I thanked you for that. Yep. So I, I don't know if Ayn Rand ever really, when she was in the, in the 1930s, writing her plays, working in Hollywood, would ever thought about this. With, you know, well, capitalism. she didn't really do much economics, particularly not in those days. She was much more concerned right. about, about writing her novels, about deep philosophical yeah. issues. And, and economics, she didn't really get interested in more of the policy, the politics, the economics, writing about those kind of things until the 1960s. Um, I mean, although she, she was involved in some political campaigns in the 30s, uh, she didn't write much about these kind of issues. So, uh, so no. So thanks, Frank. I really appreciate it. Look, tariffs are just a tax. And they're not a tax on China. They're a tax on Americans. And I thought we all understood the taxes were bad. The taxes uh, restricted economic activity. So when I go and buy a, uh, something from China and there's a tariff on it, it's a, I'm paying that tariff. It's not the Chinese guy paying the tariff. I am. It's hurting me directly. It's hurting me directly. Who are you penalizing with tariffs? Americans. Okay, so this brings me to the bigger question. I, I want to go over some of these points, um, some of these points quickly. Um, whenever government intervenes in a trade, whether it's domestic or foreign, it does damage. It doesn't matter if you're buying something from a Chinese person or you're buying something from somebody from Kentucky or from somebody across the street. If the government steps in and intervenes, it raises costs, it destroys jobs, and it distorts the marketplace. Always. And this is what tariffs do. So for example, uh, President uh, Trump raised tariffs on solar panels. So jobs are going to increase, supposedly, in solar panel manufacturing. Although that's not clear because almost all of those plants are now moving to robots. But it turns out that thousands of jobs are probably going to disappear in solar panel installation. And that's always the case. Tariffs Taxes, regulations, controls, yeah, they might benefit a few, but they destroy for the many. Two minutes. Always. What happens when we raise tariffs on steel to protect steel jobs in America? Oh, my God, steel. Yes, we might protect a few hundred or maybe even a few thousand jobs in the steel manufacturing business. But by raising the price of steel which is what tariffs do, we're destroying, we're destroying jobs in all those places that you steal. Auto industry, washing machine industry, any industry, construction industry, any industry that uses steel now sees their costs go up and jobs are going to be destroyed. Always tariffs, taxes, controls, regulations imposed by government destroy they don't add and it doesn't if you call a tax a tariff it doesn't make it good it doesn't make it virtuous it doesn't make it pro business it doesn't make it pro the economy it doesn't help anybody not in the long term not in the totality of things it reduces productivity and therefore ultimately it reduces wages it increases costs even for the people Whose 30. jobs you're protecting. The cost of the stuff they're going to buy is going to go up. So their lives long term are worse off. 20. All right. We are heading towards a break. And uh, when we come back, this is a long break. When we come back, we'll talk more about trade. But we're also going to take some of these 10. calls. So stay on the line. You're listening to Ron Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me here on, uh, on this uh, weekend, on this Saturday afternoon. Um, we're talking about trade, but really what the, the point I'm trying to make here is that you got to look at the facts. you, you got to look at reality. 
you got to look at the science. You can't go on emotion. And I know it's, it's emotionally pleasing to think we're saving American jobs. We're going to screw those Chinese. We're going to raise tariffs. But that's not the reality. That's placing emotion above facts, reason, reality, and the science of economics. Or you might be thinking this is good for America. We've got to make America great again. But that's wrong thinking. First of all, it's not good for America, so even on that standard, it's wrong. But the question is, is it good for you and me and that other person and that other person over there? And it's the answers uniformly no. The individualist approach to trade is, leave me alone. Let me trade with whoever I decide to trade. And that's what we free marketers believe in, right? That the government is supposed to leave us alone, that the government shouldn't be deciding who we should trade with and who we shouldn't. If we're offended by some manufacturer because we don't like their practices, then we stop trading with them. It's not the business of government to tell us any of this. Unless there's a violation of rights, unless there's clearly theft involved or fraud involved, why is the government intervening? And I don't understand this because this, I mean, a lot of this is presented as if this is a, a position of people who are pro-capitalist. Donald Trump claims to be pro-markets, but he's not. So let's be real. Let's call him what he is. He's a mixed economist, economy president, just like every other president has been. He's not a free market guy because you cannot believe in tariffs and believe in free markets. You cannot believe in subsidies and believe in free markets. You cannot believe in bailouts and believe in free markets. And Donald Trump believes in tariffs, subsidies, and bailouts. So he's not a free market guy. I mean, it's not an issue of liking or not liking Donald Trump. Just, just be clear about what's involved. There is no good side to tariffs. There is no legitimacy for the government to tax our consumption arbitrarily, any, any way, but certainly arbitrarily, some goods and not other goods. It's completely arbitrary. There's no good side to tariffs. And the last time we got into a trade war, which was smoot Hawley uh, by the Hoover administration, it spiraled the world into a Great Depression. Trade is a massive part of the world economy today. Massive. Much more than in 1929, 1930, 31. This whole attitude towards protectionism, this whole attitude towards, uh, uh, towards uh, tariffs, has nothing to do with reality or fact or economics. It's tribalism. It's you're offended by the fact that the Chinese government is doing things that you don't want them to do. Fine. It doesn't justify the U.S. government getting involved. So let's be clear on what a proper trade strategy is. Proper trade policy would be unilaterally to lower all tariffs on all goods to zero. Zero. And indeed, there's one country in the world that does that today, Hong Kong. And even though Hong Kong has no natural resources and has no advantages, really, the fact that it has zero tariffs has made the citizens of Hong Kong, on a per capita basis, adjusted for cost of living, richer than Americans, on average. And they did it in far less time than we've had, with far fewer resources, with far fewer everything. How did they do it? Because they're free. Hong Kong has zero tariffs, unilaterally. When England became a real superpower economically during the mid-19th century, it was because they adopted Adam Smith's view of unilateral free trade. They repealed, originally it was the Corn Laws, they repealed tariffs. And they drove them down to close to zero and ushered in an era of unimaginable economic success all over the world. Indeed, the United States had tariffs much of its history, but that has stilted growth. That has hurt us. If you go to Korea, South Korea, it has lots of tariffs and, and, and trade controls. That has restricted their ability to grow. They would be a lot richer if they actually had, like Hong Kong, free trade. You don't need it to be reciprocal. 
All you need to do is not tax your own people. All you need to do is not penalize your own people. Free trade in your neighborhood is good. We don't go around boycotting people from the other street because we don't want to buy their goods, even if their goods are cheaper. We, we don't restrict trade among states, even though some states subsidize their businesses. California subsidizes Tesla extensively, just like the Chinese government subsidizes some of their companies. But we don't have the government restricting the ability of, com of, of people in Texas to buy cars in California because the California government is acting stupidly. We don't restrict trade, luckily, not yet, across states. The only reason I think we don't restrict trade across states is because the Constitution prohibits it. Still, one of the things, I mean, we do restrict some trade between states, unfortunately. Like, we can't buy, I can't buy a health insurance policy in Texas if I live in California. I'm here in Puerto Rico, and, and I can't buy a, a, a insurance policy that covers me in the United States, in, in like Texas and in Puerto Rico. I have to either be in Texas or in Puerto Rico. So, I mean, the United States has lots of protectionist policies, even between states, but nobody thinks those are good things. Nobody on the free market side thinks those are good things. The socialist thinks, thinks those are good things. And when you align, when you ally with President Trump on trade, when you ally with President Trump on tariffs, you're aligning with socialists. That's basically... A socialist policy. There's no, again, free trade justification. There's no, sorry, capitalist freedom justification for tariffs or any kind of restrictions on trade. Um, so at the end of the day, what we want is a rights protecting government. At the end of the day, we want the government off our backs. And that is true of trade, just that it is in any other realm. All right, when I come back, I'm going to take up some objections quickly, and then we're going to wrap up the discussion of trade. I'm going to take a few of these calls, and, uh, and we'll wrap up the show. We're almost there. Uh, thanks for listening. You're listening to the Iran Book Show. We're on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. Iran. Hi, you're listening to the Iran Brooks Show, and we're talking about trade. And I want to make I want to make one more I want to make one big point, and then some just some refute some of the mythologies around this. Um, one of the things that Donald Trump said uh, in Davos was, and, and Gary Cohen said it maybe best. He says we want the world to invest in America and to create jobs for hard hardworking Americans. So basically, they want the world to invest in American business, invest in American companies. How is the world going to get dollars in order to do that? The only way for them to do that is from trade. Investing in America is the flip side of trade. One of the notions that people have is when we buy stuff from the Chinese, the dollars go to China and they disappear. And they, do, they say the same thing about remittances. When uh, the immigrants who come here send checks to Mexico, the dollars just arrive in Mexico and then they disappear. What are those dollars used for? All those dollars basically flow back to the United States ultimately. What are they used for? They're used either to buy American goods or they're used to invest in America. The only money foreigners have to invest in America is money they got from selling us stuff, trade. They sell off our stuff, we give them our pieces of paper called dollars. They don't actually, they can't actually do anything with those pieces of paper. So they either use those pieces of paper to buy stuff from us, or they use those pieces of paper to invest in our companies, to buy equity or bonds from us. But one way or the other, the money all comes back. So if you want the world to invest in America, you have to be willing to buy stuff from the world. And the more you raise tariffs, the less dollars the world has to invest with you. And therefore, 
the less they're going to invest. So again, this is Gary Cohen. They don't know economics. I'm sorry, they're ignorant. They don't know economics. Not Trump and not his chief economic advisor, Gary Cohen. The fact that they're both businessmen, the, ba the fact that they're both businessmen is great. That does not guarantee knowing any economics, unfortunately. I wish it wasn't the case. I wish it was the other way around. All right, let's see. What a few more points that I want to make about this issue. Um, one of the reasons, by the way, that we need foreigners to invest in America, to invest in our companies, to, in to buy our bonds, is that we don't save. And we run a massive deficit, which the Trump administration is only increasing. So we have to, our government has to borrow huge quantities of money. And since Americans are not saving, Americans are only consuming, their money has to come from outside. We consume by buying foreign goods that those dollars then come back and buy our government bonds. If we stopped consuming and saved more, then we would have a different trade deficit, right? But is that good? I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with uh, trade deficits. There's nothing wrong with consuming. Consuming's fun. And as we get older, that's what we should do with our money. What, are we going to put it in the mattress and, and, and die sleeping with it? All right, a few objections that I always get, right? What about Steelworker who loses his job? Yeah, he loses his job. But the economy is healthier, more jobs are being created, and therefore he'll probably find another job. The fact is that uh, by lowering tariffs by, to zero, you reduce prices in the economy and you increase the number of jobs in the economy. So yes, a particular steel worker might lose his job, but almost everybody else benefits, and that steel worker will ultimately benefit from a healthier, more productive, uh, 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 higher standard of living because that's the kind of economy that is generated when you have a zero tariffs environment. If you don't have a job, you can't enjoy low prices. True, get a job. But the fact is that places like Hong Kong and places like the U.S., if it had free trade, true free trade, then there would be plenty of jobs. Plenty of jobs. Think about all the solar panel installers that never had a job in solar panel installation before we started importing massive quantities of cheap solar panels into the U.S. Now, there's also the issue of the U.S. government subsidizing that, but we'll put that aside. Free trade requires that all trading partners practice free trade. Not true. All free trade requires is that you practice free trade, and you gain all the benefits from it. The other party is screwing themselves. They're causing damage to their own economy, their own consumers, and their own producers. Long term, they will become uncompetitive, and they will lose whatever economic edge they have. Economic growth in the United States was fueled by high tariffs. Not true. Again, the high tariffs that existed in the past in the United States always were inhibitors on economic growth, never supportive of economic growth. High-wage countries are at a disadvantage when competing against low-wage countries. Not true. High-wage countries are high-wage countries because the productivity of their labor is higher and because the cost of living in those countries is higher. A low-wage labor in China is low-wage because they're less productive and because the cost of living is lower. That's not what gives them the advantage. With free trade, rich countries unfairly exploit poor countries. That's a typical leftist claim. Again, quite the contrary. What rich countries are doing uh, by importing is creating jobs in those poor countries, which benefits the poor people there, the individuals there. Sh trade should be free only if it is fair. There's no such thing. Fair trade is free trade. Free trade is fair trade. There's nothing, there's no concept of free trade separate, uh, sorry, a fair trade separate from free trade. The playing field isn't level. It never is. Grow up. Trade deficits are bad for us. No, they're not. No economic theory behind that one. Trade deficits are evidence that other countries are cheating at trade. It's simply not true. Uh, it, all, it, all it means is that we save less, they save more, 
they want to invest in us. We want to consume more by buying their stuff. That's all. That's what it means. All right, as I said, the only real issue with trade in these contexts is, is the issue of, of stealing intellectual property, and the proper way of dealing with that is both through foreign policy and through boycotting those products and the government banning those products, explicitly identifying those companies and banning them. Look, while economics can be complex, and I'm not pretending that I've given you all the economic arguments and the proof, economic proof, that, that this is all true, if you view things as an individualist, it becomes very clarifying. Trade is good for me. I am buying stuff from somebody in China. That's great. It, it, it's, it's increasing my standard of living. The stuff from China that I'm buying is cheap. It's good. If, if, if you put a tax on that, my cost of living goes up. My quality of life goes down. My standard of living goes down. That's simple. That's all you need to know about trade. Everything else is, is, is garbage. All you have to know is how it affects you personally and how it affects every individual personally. Do some people benefit from tariffs? Yes, those people whose jobs are being protected artificially. And they're only benefiting short-term, long-term, they're suffering because long-term, their cost of living goes up. Long-term, the, the options in terms of jobs are going to go down. And long-term, because their businesses are being protected, like American auto companies, they're probably not going to do well. They're probably not good businesses. So they're probably going to lose their job anyway. That's the individualist perspective. But we live in a tribal world. It's made in America. It's our tribe versus their tribe. We don't like their tribe. So we're going we're gonna to only buy our tribe stuff. That's communism, that's fascism, that's collectivism, that's not America. America is about making your life better. It's about buying the best stuff that you can buy for the money, no matter where it is made in the world, and demanding that the government stay out of your way, demanding that the government not impose a tax on your purchases. That's America. That's individualism. And that's what we should all be demanding. All right, I see some of my callers gave up. I apologize. Uh, I'm going to take your calls if you call back in. So uh, I apologize for uh, holding you on so long, but you weren't calling about trade. All right, uh, we're going we're gonna to take a call from Tara in uh, California. Is calling about a completely different issue, but an important one. Hey, Tara. I wanted to thank you, and I will relate it. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Hello? I'm here. I can hear you. Okay, I wanted to, I wanted to thank you. A year ago, I listened to a debate between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. And I do admire both of them. They're very smart, but sure. it was such a frustrating conversation. They were talking about what is truth. And Jordan Peterson would defend free will, but he denied basic, log basic logic, didn't think we could know what reality is. And Sam Harris defended reality and logic, but he said, we don't have free will. Yep. We're the same as a toaster. It didn't make any sense to me. And I thought, how can we defend the Enlightenment, if we can't agree on both logic and free will, and is there no one who will defend this? Is there nobody who has worked this out? And it wasn't until I listened to you, and you said, go read Ayn Rand, and I'd never read Ayn Rand because, you know, when I was young, I was a socialist, and I was biased, and I didn't do it. Yep. But, I, but you challenged, and I said, okay. So I did it. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is the answer I've been searching for for like a year by this point. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you. And I am a historian, and I agree with everything you said about the history of trade. It's, it's absolutely true. And yet I was still always confused about these issues until I understood the ethical principles underlying Excellent. the economics and the metaphysical principles underlying the ethics. Excellent. So thank you so much because oh. it's clarified so many of these confusing things like tariffs, which and, I could always just get t tangled up in before. And, and, um, and you, you heard me through the blaze? Uh, I, I saw one of your things on YouTube, I on think. On YouTube, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that's know. where most people find me. So, well, that's a wonderful yeah. story, and it makes my day, and it's why I do what I do. It's, it's uh, with the hope of having an impact like that on somebody's life. Uh, so that's fantastic. I really appreciate it, and I really appreciate letting me know that, uh, that, uh, that that's how you find, found Ayn Rand. Yeah, I mean, my life was changed when I read Ayn Rand, and I encourage everybody out there, to go read Rand, and, and many of you who've read her, go read her again or, or read something new from her because there's a ton of stuff. She wrote a lot, and you always learn something new. You always, always, always learn something new. 
So thank you, Tara. Thanks for calling. I really appreciate it. Um, it is the ethical principles at the end of the day. It is this idea of individualism and, and, and taking care of yourself and pursuing your own self-interest that it's a heart of this. It is those kind of principles that basically are much more important than any economic argument I could make. At the end of the day, it's none of your business, you being the majority of voters, who I buy stuff from. And I could expand that to apply to at least some aspects of immigration. It's none of your business who I employ. I mean, this whole idea that employers should check whether their employees are legal or illegal immigrants is despicable. That's the job of the government, not the job of employers. I should be able to hire anybody I want. And as long as they're not violating your rights, why is it any of your business? Why is it any of your business what I buy them from whom? As long as they're not violating rights, as long as I'm not violating your rights, it's none of your business. That's America. America is about leaving individuals free to make decisions for themselves about the choices they make. It's about free will exercised by free individuals, free of government coercion, free of government force, free of government imposition, free of government authority, free of government taxation that is trying to, trying to get me to buy American. That's tribalism again. That's not individualism. Not individualism. So, you know, the whole ethical perspective. One minute. Of thinking about what's good for you, making that the standard for all questions in politics. Not what for good for you in the short run. What not, not what's good for you materially right now, but what's good for you from a freedom perspective. The standard is... Does this promote freedom of the individual or does it inhibit freedom of the individual? And tariffs are easy. Tariffs restrict my freedom. They take my money. 30. They impose the government's will on me. And therefore, tariffs are out. Trade restrictions are out. I demand freedom. 20. Uh, the founding fathers fought a war over taxes on tea and other impositions on freedom. Far less than what the U.S. government today under any administration Ten. imposes on us. We'll be back after this. You're listening to The Iran Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're back. And I have to say, some of those commercials for other people's shows drive me nuts. Um, <laughs> he wants to see a wall that you can see from space. Why? <laughs> Who are we trying to protect ourselves from? Who's invading? Who's trying to take over the United States? I mean, is Mexico an enemy that we need a wall? I mean, I can understand somewhat the walls in Israel because people want to kill the Israelis. They, they're invading. They actually want to destroy the state. Maybe even the walls in, in, in Rome, the barbarians were coming. Didn't help them much, those walls. But, but what's this wall with Mexico going to protect us from? Who is out there to destroy us? Who is going to kill us all? Mexicans? Right now, Mexican unemployment is lower than it is in the United States. Right now, Mexicans are not crossing the border into the United States illegally. The jobs are just not there. There's just no, no benefit for it. The fact is, if you look at the numbers, illegal immigration from Mexico peaked between... Uh, 95 and 2,000, at about 3 million. And then after that, about half of that came in in the next five years. And the five years after that, even less. So that by, so, uh, uh, by 2007, by 2007, right, most of the immigration between Mexico and the United States was moving from the U.S. to Mexico. 1.4 million Mexicans returned home. 1.4 million Mexicans returned home. The actual population of Mexicans in the United States shrunk from 6.9 million to 5.6 million from 2007 to 2014. 
because almost none of them came here. Almost everybody went the other way. So what are we, building the wall to prevent Mexicans from leaving because we need them to build our homes? We need them to pick our strawberries? We need them to be our gardeners? I mean, it's insanity. It truly is insane. We're going to spend $22 billion, $22 billion that we suck out of the private economy, which would be allocated based on profit productively. And instead, we're going to give it to a bunch of bureaucrats to build a stupid wall, which is going to be unproductive, going to serve no purpose. For what? Because we're afraid. This is, again, emotion over reason. We're afraid. Our culture, our country has become a country of wusses, afraid of a few immigrants coming across the border. One of the reasons illegal immigration from Mexico was so high in those days, because uh, Mexican birth rates used to be something like seven children per woman. And what happened was when uh, health care improved in Mexico in the 60s and 70s, suddenly these kids were staying alive. Suddenly these kids actually weren't dying, which is why we used to have lots of kids in the past, because most of them would die. And now they didn't have jobs, so they cross over into the United States. Today, average Mexican family has 2.4 kids. It's per woman, which is about replacement costs. And unemployment in Mexico is about 3.3%, which is lower than in the United States. The Mexican economy is growing faster than the U.S. economy. We're going to beg them to send people. We're going to beg them to send people. Now, let me know, some of you in the comments, really, basic economics, people. When the government takes money away from the private sector, either through taxation or through bonds, it is taking money away from individuals making decisions based on a proper allocation of capital. And then when the government consumes it, that is consumption and waste. Even if by consuming it, it pays private enterprise. It's that capital, instead of being invested productively, is now being invested unproductively. That's why Keynes is wrong. That's why government stimulus doesn't move the economy. Because paying people to dig ditches and then fill them up, even though those people are private people, they're not government employees, is wasteful. It's taking money out of the private economy and applying it to wasteful government consumption. And that's what a wall is. That's what a wall is. Emigration out of Mexico is way, way, way down. It used to be 144 for every 10,000 Mexicans were leaving the country. Now it's under 39 per 10,000. But we're afraid of them. Oh, my God, they're going to change our culture. They're going to vote for Democrats. They're going to destroy America. Although Mex it's not going to be Mexicans. It might be Hondurans. It might be, I don't know, Canadians. It might be Norwegians. But it's not going to be Mexicans because Mexicans are not coming here illegally by large numbers anymore. There's just no incentive to do so. Indeed, as I said, many of them are going back home, and now the wall is going to prevent them from doing that. Not that the wall will ever be built properly to prevent anybody from moving anywhere. So, All right. Um, Let's, uh, yeah, let's take, you know what, let's take an early break, and then when we come back, I'll open up the lines for any questions you have, and uh, we'll take uh, Skyler and Stuart uh, when we come back. So you're listening to your Ron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back after this break. Yaron Brook. I'm telling you, I, I really think the Republican Party and conservatives in general are going to crucify themselves. They, they are going to commit suicide in mass over this immigration and this wall issue. The, 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 the tribalism implied in it, the hysteria, the emotionalism, the anti-reason, the anti-economics, the, uh, the anti-individualism in all of it is... It's just stunning that this is the number one issue 
that conservatives and Republicans have made it into. It, it is going to kill the party. It's going to kill any efforts uh, to actually produce a, a free market in this country because people for forever are going to associate the free market with anti-trade and build the wall anti-immigration rhetoric of, of Donald Trump and his supporters. And it stuns me that people who should know better uh, you know, get uh, caught up in this hysteria about illegal immigration. By the way, again, secure the border. The border is pretty secure. I haven't seen anybody invade this country. Anybody invade this country across the southern border. Almost no, I, I don't know of any terrorist activity that's been initiated by somebody crossing the border illegally. I, I, I don't know what they're talking about. Secure the border from what? From people coming here to work? Okay. Even that is down dramatically. And has been coming down since 2000, and certainly since 2008. So, yeah, like that is the problem in America. It's not regulation. It's not government control. It's not the attacks on free speech. No. I mean, indeed, conservatives are joining the attacks on free speech by calling for the breakup of Facebook, Google, Amazon. They're joining the attacks. That's real issues. That's really important. This discussion of immigration is a sideshow. And yet, the Republican Party has staked it its entire message on the issue of immigration. And I think it'll kill it. I think it will kill it. Even if there's truth in what they say, which there isn't, but even if there's truth in what they say, the single-mindedness of it is self-destructive. It's self-destructive. Um, and and that's, that's tragic. It really is tragic. All right. Um, let's see. Let's let's take the let's take the call from Stuart, and then we'll go to Skylar. Hi, Stuart. Stuart, you there? Cool. Speak up. Okay, so I want to ask you about a, a protectionist argument called the race to the bottom. I want to ask you about your opinion on a particular rebuttal to it. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it, it's, it's completely nonsense, and it's, it's hard to even take it seriously because what they're basically saying is that competition drives wages down and drives the value, the, the quality of products down. When all of history and everything we know about trade suggests the exact opposite, what competition draw, does is drive wages up and drives the quality of products up and drives the prices of the products down. And it doesn't matter if that competition is within a border or outside of the border. It's exactly the same thing. So it's just a completely bogus argument that has no basis in reality, none. And, and again, this is the kind of stuff leftists, uh, uh, ignorant leftists usually promote. And it's stunning to me that people on the right are now embracing these kind of arguments. But I want to ask you about a rebuttal by Benjamin Powell and Owen Bodvarsson, they say that even if immigrants don't start their own business, the very fact that these immigrant workers spend money on the amenities like food, clothing, and shelter, you know, helps create jobs for domestic workers, native-born workers, because when they come to the United States and they, they compete for jobs and then they earn money, it's not as if they just sit on the money, they have I mean to spend the money too. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Although people say, but they send it to Mexico. But then the argument is that money has to come back. I, I just don't, I don't like these economic arguments because, I mean, the economics is simple. The only, the only detriment to immigration from an economic perspective is welfare, is, is, is the idea that they consume more welfare than they, than, they, uh, than they pay into the system, supposedly. But then let's do our way with welfare. And, and the, economic, the economic data is mixed on this point. But I don't want to argue the economic data. I want to argue that welfare is bad. And I, I've said this often. I'm actually more offended by an American taking welfare who's grown up with the system, who, who, who has benefited from this wonderful system we have in America, than an immigrant who's come here to work in and fallen in bad times. Now, if they come here just for the welfare, then don't give it to them. Ban all immigrants from receiving welfare. I'm fine with that. But uh, any other argument is just a silly argument. Uh, now, do some people lose because immigrants come? Yeah. Yeah, just like some people lose because of robotics and some people lose because of trade in the short run. 
but it enhances the economy at lowest prices. It increases standard of living. And if you're ambitious and you're willing to learn and you're willing to switch jobs and you're willing to move, then immigrants are not a threat to you. They're actually a positive for all those economic arguments that Powell makes. All right. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, you know, I think. Go ahead. Mahalo. So I think that so I noticed in the comments, people are saying that tariffs are capitalist. And I think it's silly. But tariff manipulates you into hiring me instead of someone else. Then the tariff is welfare for me. The tariff is it's just a tax. State it's pretending to be free commerce. Yeah, the tariff is just tax. It's just a tax. It's not anything but a tax. And to view it in any other way is stupid. And if, if people believe that it's right to manipulate Americans through the tax system to behave in this or that way, to hire this person or to fire that person, then, then they have a distorted view of the role of government. And then they're not free market people. And they, they're not even founding fathers people. Because the, the, the idea of manipulating people through the tax system, through coercion, is wrong. It's morally wrong and it's politically wrong. Great, Stuart. Thanks for the call. Uh, let's go to Skyler. Hi, you're on the Iran Brooks Show. Hey, Skyler. Greetings, Dr. Brooks. If I'm correct, this is your last show on The Blaze? It is my last show on The Blaze. Well, congratulations on your run, sir. Uh, my life has been enriched and enhanced by, on you, by uh, you being on this platform, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on other shows and platforms in the future. Well, I appreciate that, Skyler. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. My question is in regard to the president. Uh, he has said on more than one occasion how the black uh, unemployment rate has, uh, has you know, dramatically fallen. And my questions are, pertain to does it matter? Should we say black unemployment? Is that is that a legitimate thing to say? Well, in an ideal world, no. And, and uh, you know, I'd like to get to the point where nobody even measures that, that, they, that we don't look at anybody's race right. for any purpose. The only reason it's interesting today is as a sociological issue. If, un if black unemployment, if unemployment among blacks is higher than other, other groups, then the question is why? For example, is it racism? Is it uh, the culture within those black communities and so on? It's certainly not an issue for the president of the United States. I think it is an issue, a sociological issue, uh, that people legitimately can study and, and come to conclusions. And if it's, uh, if it's racism, they might be educational things that uh, some people might want to do in order to defeat racism. If it's cultural, then we might want to go into the, in, into the cultures that are that for whatever reason there's more unemployment there and, and help those cultures along so that they don't inhibit employment. So I don't think it's an issue for politics. I don't think it's an issue for government, but I do, I can't imagine that it could be an issue for sociologists. Absolutely. And economists, you know, who are interested in these kind of phenomena right. and interested in the way culture and the way uh, culture impacts things like unemployment. Does that make and sense? And that goes back to, Yes, yes, sir. And, and that kind of reminds me of what you were saying when your uh, children were born about why you had to fill out the forms of what race they were. Is that is that like similar to this situation? Yeah. Like where I mean, I find it about what, what I, race they are? I find that separating people out, identifying people out based on race is despicable. It's disgusting. And it, the fact that in the United States of America, you have to list a race when you fill out the form. So I, for example, when I get the census, I refuse to fill out the section about race. I just leave it blank. And then they always come knocking at my door and they say, you know, you have to fill this in. And I say, no, arrest me. You know, I'm not filling it in. <laughs> yeah. And, and they right. usually just go away and leave me alone. But, but I refuse to fill that in. It is not the business of the government to define Absolutely. me based on some arbitrary criteria of race. I, you know, and it's not, it's not the business of, of, of the government. And it's not anybody's business. So whenever I see any kind of uh, questionnaire at the doctor's uh, or anyway, and it says, what race are you? I either leave it blank or, put, or, or if it's like an online thing where you have to fill it in to go to the next question, I put other. Right. Other. Absolutely. Which makes them assume I'm some kind of, uh, I guess, mixed race person, and that confuses their statistics. And good. <laughs> You know, so, so yeah, I, I, I think the whole obsession with race that we have in this country, and, the, and, and unfortunately not just in this country, is, um, is just horrific. It's just horrific. So, uh, but, 
you know, it's, it's going to be a while. And this is, goes to the theme. Thanks, Skylar. I, I really appreciate the call and appreciate uh, your support uh, on the show. And by the way, the fact that it, this is my last Blaze show doesn't mean you can't listen to your own book show. The show continues, will continue on uh, Blog Talk Radio, on YouTube, on Facebook, uh, on uh, iTunes, on Stitcher, on every platform pretty much known for man except the Blaze. Um, so uh, the, the, the show would continue, and, uh, you know, if anything, we're going to intensify and we're going to do more, and uh, we're going to try to increase our reach out there into the world. With this idea, this idea that I mentioned early on, which is related to what uh, Skyler just called about, the idea that at the heart of what America is is the idea of the individual. Skin color shouldn't matter. Race shouldn't matter. Nothing should matter other than your qualities as an individual, your character. And I believe in free will. I believe in our ability to shape our own lives and to shape ourselves. And as a consequence, I believe that people should take responsibility over their own lives. Stop worrying about people in China and stop worrying about yourself. Make your life the best life that it can be. Strive to improve yourself. And the only way to do that, the only way to do that is by embracing reason, by embracing facts, by embracing reality, by not letting emotions guide you and emotions dictate the world to you. Not let other people dictate the truth to you. The truth you have to discover and you have to figure out by using your own mind. Nobody else can do it for you. Nobody else will do it for you. Don't believe the President of the United States. Don't believe your congressman. Don't believe your professors. Don't believe anybody. Figure it out for yourself. Even your doctor. If it's a crucial diagnosis, Two minutes. go do a research. Go get a second opinion. Go get a third opinion. We need to re-embrace in this country that attitude of self-reliance, of personal responsibility, personal responsibility for our own happiness. There's nothing more important in life than pursuing your own happiness, than achieving your own happiness. And to do that, we need to be free. We need to be left alone. We need to be free to use our minds, use our reason, to guide our life in pursuit of our own selfish happiness. And that's what I fight for every day. That's what you guys should fight for every day. Get the government off our backs. So that we, each one of us as an individual, can choose who to trade with and who not to trade with. Who to communicate with and who not to communicate with. Who, what to read and what not to read. And how to live for ourselves. And if you want to understand these ideas better, if you want to get a deeper understanding of what these ideas, then read the greatest author of the 20th century and the greatest thinker of the last millennium, Ayn Rand. Atlas Shrugged. The Fountainhead, The Virtue of Selfishness, read Ayn Rand. That's my parting wish to all of you. Of course, you can also read my books, The you know, uh, Free Market Revolution, Ready. Equal is Unfair. Um, hey, I've enjoyed uh, being on The Blaze. I've enjoyed having all of you as listeners. I hope, uh, I hope to meet up with you on other platforms, in other places. Uh, have a great life, and uh, all the best to this greatest country in Ten. human history, the United States of America. Thank you all, and uh, I'll see you somewhere.